And this is a continuation of the studies of what is written, the fulfillment of Scripture, when it is explicitly called out in the Gospels. There are several times in the Gospels when uh, it says something to the effect of that the Scripture might be fulfilled, or as it is written, or as the prophet said, or you know things along this these lines. There are several references like this that I would say, uh, you know, form a a list or a, a set of places in the Gospels where we're told explicitly what Old Testament passage they had in mind. And uh, we've seen this already in our studies in John 19 with not one of his bones shall be broken, and they looked on him whom they have pierced. We've seen that in many cases, these references are not um, what you would call, what I would call literal, in that they're not foretelling a specific instance of the Son of God become flesh, has this thing happened to him, but rather they are setting up a pattern um, or uh, a story, a narrative that the Lord fulfills, and fulfills completely. So I want to look in Matthew 27 at the account of Judas, who had betrayed the Lord for the price of 30 pieces of silver, returning the silver and what happened to it. Because in this place, Matthew records that we have fulfillment of Scripture, and he gives the name of a prophet, and he gives a direct quotation as well. So, this actually began in Matthew 27 at verse 3. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. Because he had agreed with them to uh, hand Jesus over to them, asking what they would pay him. And they agreed that they would pay him 30 pieces of silver. They were, you know, they were glad, which is from Matthew 26, verses 14, uh, 15, and 16. This Judas went to the chief priest, what will you give me if I deliver him? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. From that time, he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. But after Jesus is betrayed, we are in Matthew 27. Again, that was the third verse. When he saw Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. He brought back the 30 pieces. He said to them, I've sinned, betraying innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said it's not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money, which is ironic. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. That's Matthew 27.10. So these are the things that happened. Judas betrayed the Lord, and... Uh, yeah, Judas betrayed the Lord, and... He came back, giving them the 30 pieces of silver again, but it was immaterial to them. But he was so much, you know, if you will, wanted to protest that he threw it. And where he threw that was into the temple. But they took it and would not allow it to, to be put into the temple treasury, but used it to buy a potter's field instead. Then Matthew tells us at 27, 9, and 10, 
then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet. So we have these things to deal with. Now, one of the difficulties that faces you immediately uh, in this particular reference is that the quotation there in Matthew 27, verse 9, they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set, is not from the book of Jeremiah. It is from the book of Zechariah. It is from Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Although the 10th verse, they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me, is from Jeremiah chapter 32, in verse 14. And there are two different stories here. Even though he names Jeremiah, the first quotation is from Zechariah. In Zechariah 11, uh, at the end of verse 12, it began saying, They weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. And then Zechariah eleven thirteen. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So this is the quotation from Zechariah. In Jeremiah 32, um, Jeremiah is instructed to buy a field, which he does at verse 9. But at verse 14, after he's bought the field, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Jeremiah 32, 14, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, the sealed deed of purchase and the open deed, put them in an earthenware vessel. They take the purchase price, they give it to the pot, the potter, the earthenware. So Matthew is putting these things together and giving us both of them. And the way that I think we need to deal with this is looking again at Matthew 27, verse 9. Because for us moderns, certainly, it seems like a violation to give a name and give a direct quote, and that quote is not actually attributable to that person's name. Um, we have different rules, I'll say, for quotations than the ancients did. They certainly had a, a different idea. For them, quoting somebody or attributing something to, the, as, you know, he said this, consisted of accurately representing his position, not, you know, verbatim copying the words that left his mouth. It was still a quotation as long as what you said was accurate in a representation of what they meant when they said the literal words that left their mouth, whatever it was. Um, there's a point in the gospel where uh, Jesus is saying, um, you know, did I not call all of you? And yet one of you is the devil. And then later when he's explaining it to them, he says, therefore, that's why I said not all of you are clean. Well, he didn't say that. He said, one of you is a devil. Yeah, but it's clear that what he said was, not all of you are clean. <laughs> it's the same thing. In the mind of the ancient person, that's, that's a quote. That's the same. And this is why your different gospels that clearly record the same event may have literally different wording or different word order. But the thing that is being presented, the essence, is the same. And nobody in ancient times would have had a problem with that. So they have, they're have they more permissive about this than we are. Um, you know, the other example I thought about was, uh, was football. <laughs> you know, in American football, inches matter. <laughs> and we have replay cameras. And they can call things back. You know, in European football, which is soccer, eh. 
the, the referee kind of has a lot of latitude as to whether that was right or wrong, and you don't get to argue, and there's not a replay. And how much time is left when, you know, when the clock runs out? You know, we're down to the, to the tenth of the second as an American football. They're like, yeah, we spent a lot of time in penalties. We're adding another five minutes to this game. They do that all the time. It's just a different perspective. They're both regulated. They're both governed by referees. So that's just an example. All right. The key to understanding Matthew, I think, um, is the way that he's introducing this at verse 9 when he says, then was fulfilled. I think when he says then, that word is very heavy. He's not just referring to when Judas returns the money, which he did, or just to the money itself. He's referring to the larger story. This is the point at which and from which, you know, going forward, at this point, the death of Christ is set into motion. This is the point of no return. It has been done. It is set. This is in motion. They are going to kill him. This is the meaning because, you know, and, and so what he's saying is when he says, then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah. And then he also adds the quotation from Zechariah. He's saying not just Judas's betrayal, but the entire nation's rejection and betrayal of the Lord's chosen shepherd. Because Zechariah is prophesying in chapter 11, which we're going to look at here, but in summary, he's prophesying that the spiritual leaders of Israel would betray the Lord's chosen shepherd. That's what Zechariah 11 is all about. The Lord has a shepherd, and they're betraying him. They were supposed to be the shepherds, but they're not doing it. They're doing evil to the people. And they betrayed the shepherd that the Lord chose. That's Zechariah 11. Jeremiah 32 is about the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Babylon. And yet... Despite this impending destruction, Jeremiah is being told to buy a piece of land <laughs> because God will destroy this generation, <laughs> and for good reasons. That's Jeremiah 32. But he would also restore a coming generation. And that's why he had to buy a piece of land and put the deed into pottery to preserve it in the way, if you've ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's the exact kind of pottery we're talking about, that it would be placed in, in the hands of the potter, you know, it'd be placed into something that is a preservation jar to make it last for a long time, which obviously worked <laughs> since we discovered ancient scrolls in what, whatever year that was, 1950 or something. But Zechariah is prophesying that the leaders will betray the, the Lord's chosen shepherd. Jeremiah is prophesying that God will destroy this generation, but he's going to establish another one and restore it. And they both are using this vehicle of the value is, in, is being placed on hold, or the value is being placed into storage in pottery. And that's why Matthew brings them together. He's telling us Jeremiah is being fulfilled, and he brings in Zechariah's quotation as well, because they both of them have very pertinent details, and they're both different aspects on the same thing, which is the Lord was betrayed. He was rejected by those who were supposed to receive him and who were supposed to be shepherding the people. And the wrath of God would come on this generation. And yet, he would establish a spiritual kingdom, albeit through jars of clay. 
so this is where we're going with it. You know, um, it. This has been to me. This has been a difficult study. I, I hope it's not been difficult for you so far. <laughs> but we're going back to Zechariah eleven. Um, it, I felt that it was difficult to harmonize these quotations, but at first, but I can see now that now that this makes sense. And I'll try to help others to see that it makes sense. So let's look at Zechariah 11, which is God's shepherd betrayed. And it's verses 4 to 14. Thus said the Lord, my God, become shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter. So what's happening here? Well, in Zechariah 11, 4 to 14, what we're saying is, when Jesus came to Judea, the leaders of the people were destroying the people. Jesus became the shepherd, but they rejected him for 30 pieces of silver. And what is 30 pieces of silver? It's the price of the life of a slave in the law of Moses. That's what Zechariah 11 verses 4 to 14 is about. So the fourth verse, he said, become shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter. And I would note here Hebrews 5 verses 4, 5, and 6 because Zechariah is being told by the Lord in prophecy in 11.4, become the shepherd. He's the chosen one, but he's chosen by God. Hebrews 5, verses 4, 5, and 6 says, no one takes this honor to himself only when called by God as Aaron was, the priest that is. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you and you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. My point being, God appointed him. He's God's chosen shepherd. That's what I would do with Zechariah 11, verse 4. Become the shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter. Then Zechariah 11, verse 5, those who buy them, slaughter them, and go unpunished. And those who sell them, say, blessed be the Lord, I become rich. And their own shepherds have no pity on them. What is this? It's three shepherds, three different kinds of shepherds. Those who are supposed to be the leaders of the people are in three categories in Zechariah 11, verse 5. The first category is those who buy them, slaughter them, and go unpunished. The second category is those who sell them, and they say, Blessed be the Lord, I've become rich. <laughs> and the third category is their own shepherds have no pity on them. So there are, there are those who come, you know, if you will, from outside, whose motives are, are impure, are not good. Some buy them and slaughter them with impunity. And that's true, spiritually speaking. Some of them sell them and give thanks to God for the money that they get for selling them out. That's true. There's plenty of that happening in the te among the teachers of today. And their own shepherds have no mercy. So we do sometimes have people consuming one another, binding where the scriptures have not bound. And we certainly see all these things in first century Judea when Jesus comes. But you got three different kinds of shepherd over the house of the Lord. That's what he's saying to him. Well, in the seventh verse there, he said, So I became the shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. 
Now, that's an interesting thing that he said in the seventh verse. The sheep traders, that's what they are. They're traders. Hirelings who don't care about the flock, as Jesus would say. I believe John 10. I took two staffs. One I named favor, the other I named union. That's interesting too. Doesn't the Lord, as our shepherd, bring favor and union? He said, I tended the sheep, but in one month, that is to say, in a short time, I destroyed the three shepherds, verse 8, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. Zechariah 11, 8. In a short time, he undid what was happening, what these kinds of shepherds were doing in the land, but they hated him, and he grew impatient with them too. So I said, I'll not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. That's the first shepherd. What's to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. That's the second shepherd. Let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. That's the third shepherd. Their own who have no pity. I took the staff favor and broke it, annulling the covenant. In the 11th verse it said, So it was annulled on that day. The covenant of favor and the sheep traders who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. <laughs> Which is true. Every time the Lord is upbraiding the Pharisees, he's telling the parables. How many times? You see, maybe not every time, but how many times does it say? And they perceived that he was talking about them. <laughs> or the disciples coming, Lord, don't you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And his reply was, let them. When the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. The sheep traders were watching and they knew it was their word of the Lord. They detest him. They reject him. They hate it, but they're watching. And yes, the Lord is with him. So then Zechariah 11, verse 12, I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages. But if not, you keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. As we mentioned, it's Exodus 21 and verse 32. If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to the master 30 shekels of silver. That's the price if you accidentally kill somebody's slave. The, the life of the slave is worth 30 shekels of silver. That's why when Judas said to the chief priest, what will you give me? They weighed out 30 pieces of silver because they think of Jesus as nothing but somebody else's slave, not the servant of God. And the Lord reacts to that in Zechariah 11 Verse 13, then did the Lord say to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. That's a protest. It was a paltry sum. It was insulting. And so I took, he says, the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. And I broke my second staff union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. That's the prophecy of Zechariah. It's clear how this parallels the life of Christ and the way that he was rejected by those who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders. It's very clear in its particulars. And this is why Matthew would quote that. But we keep going into Jeremiah 32 and understand this one as well. And when we place them together... I think we can understand. That's why we brought it today. But I wrestled with this mightily. It was difficult for me to figure out how to explain this in a straightforward way, but hopefully we hit it. In Jeremiah 32, we're in a different time. Here, Babylon is threatening Babylon is coming. The king of Judah is Zedekiah. 
And this is the time. This is the generation when Babylon will besiege Jerusalem and will take it. And they'll be carried into slavery. And Jeremiah has been going around saying that because he's a prophet of the Lord. And that is the word of the Lord. So he is dutifully doing his job for which Jeremiah 32 and verse 3 Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him. Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it? Etc. Down through the fifth or sixth verse here, he has a lengthy complaint. But basically, Jeremiah is in jail because he is dutifully speaking the word of the Lord. And now he gets to respond to Zedekiah. That is what's happening in Jeremiah 32. Zedekiah says, why are you doing this? Jeremiah says, I'll explain this with some stories. And it's a little bit humorous, I guess. It's dark humor. But it's a little humorous that one of the stories is Jeremiah going to the Lord and asking him, why did you tell me to do this? <laughs> So he has the same questions that Zedekiah has, in a sense, although he's much more respectful. But the sign that the Lord gives him is verse 6, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Behold, Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle will come and say to you, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. And then... Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the garden, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, by my field, <laughs> etc. But he concludes in the eighth verse, Then I knew this was the word of the Lord, and so at verse 9, I bought the field. This is the sign. Jeremiah is presented with an opportunity to redeem the family plot at a time when the whole land is about to be taken into captivity. God's instruction to Jeremiah to buy this plot seems to make no sense to those who are there because they have no expectation that land in Judah is going to be valuable if Babylon takes over. But that's the sign. And he bought the, the field and he weighed out the money to him, it says in verse 9. This, and he weighed out silver to him in exchange for the field. So this is... These details are matching with Zechariah and with Matthew's account in the Gospels. There's details there that are in common. That's how he was able to sew these things together and see commonalities. And when he buys it, he does it in the public square. Everybody sees it. There are witnesses to every detail of the purchase. In the 14th verse, thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 32, the God of Israel, take these deeds, the sealed deed of purchase and the open deed, put them both in an earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. The deed of purchase is placed into the work of the potter by the direction of the Lord. Direct commandment of the Lord is take and throw that to the potter. And he paid a pretty small sum for a piece of land because of the value of land in those days, <laughs> as mentioned above. But the Lord said houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. What it means is the land remains valuable in a future generation, though. If you're putting it in an earthenware vessel for keeping, you're saying it's going to be around for years. In other words, when Jeremiah goes and asks him, what are you doing? The Lord, the Lord's response at verse 28 says, Behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans, and he will capture it, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So, we shouldn't be confused. And he was telling them, don't be confused. The sign 
of buying the land and preserving the deed for a future does not mean Babylon won't come. Babylon will come. This generation will be destroyed. And the Lord's response here in these verses from 28 on down to verse 15, for example, verse 15 of, of, of Jeremiah 32. I'm sorry, not 15, uh, 35, excuse me. Jeremiah 32, 28 down to 35. God gives his rationale for why this place will be destroyed. It will not be spared. What they have done to bring this upon themselves. And there's no escaping it. In other words, as Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12, concerning salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be ours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them indicated when he predicted the sufferings of the anointed and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you. The promise was not for them. It was for us. The sign of buying that piece of land was not that Babylon wouldn't come, that the city would not be destroyed. No, that's not the meaning. The meaning is a future generation will be saved. Something else is coming. But if you skip down to 37, for example, Behold, says the Lord, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger, my wrath, my great indignation. I will bring them back to this place. I will make them dwell in safety. So there's another people that's going to be set up here because he says in verse 38, I, or they will be my people, and I will be their God. That's a new people. And at verse 39, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. And yes, the one way Very interesting, but when the Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, translated this passage into Greek some 300 years before Christ, the wording they used for the one way here is the wording that the New Testament uses when it speaks of the church as the way. It's the wording that Jesus uses in John 14, 6, when he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. When in the Acts, it talks about those belonging to the way, or Peter or Paul saying, according to the way, which they call a sect, I do serve the God of my fathers. It's the church. But yes, Jeremiah 32, verse 39, I will give them one heart and one way. And verse 40 said, I'll make with them an everlasting covenant. I'll not turn away from doing good to them. I'll put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I'll rejoice in doing them good. I'll plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Yes, verse 43, fields will be bought in this land of which you are now saying it is a desolation. Because, verse 44, I will restore their fortunes. Restore your fortunes is something that occurs in the prophets many times. It occurs at the end of Job. It says the Lord restored his fortunes threefold, remember? Or doubled everything that he had. I restore their fortunes. 
The bottom line is God is going to restore the fortunes. Many times over he said this in the prophets. So that's Jeremiah 32. He's buying a piece of land because something is coming. Yeah, this generation will be destroyed, but something better, something abiding, something spiritual is coming. So what's happening here in conclusion, as I see this, kind of incredibly, and Matthew got this, of course the Holy Spirit got this, but you know what I mean. It's kind of incredible when you think about it. Why does he quote Jeremiah, or why does, yeah, why does he attribute the quote to Jeremiah, but he inserts a quotation from Zechariah into the middle of it? Because Jeremiah's story is the container into which Zechariah's story fits. <laughs> Jeremiah's story is like a pot <laughs> that the deed goes into. So Jeremiah becomes the vessel that contains the promise to a future generation that's us. Right? That, that Judea in the time of Christ were the ones who rejected the shepherd. Were the ones who considered him nothing but somebody else's slave. And yes, they were also the generation that was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. Israel was destroyed. It was never a nation again. And yet, God speaks later in Galatians 6 of the Israel of God, which is the church. And it's the fulfillment of what Jeremiah said. The details of Jeremiah just cannot be overlooked. I will gather them from all the countries. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will give them one heart, one way. I will restore their fortunes. Yeah, that was the time. The first century is the time for the fulfillment of all things that were written. That's the fullness of the time. That's when everything that was written came to pass. And you and I today are living in this time of the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom of God, the church that belongs to Christ. That's what Matthew was saying. Over in Acts 13, when Paul addresses the people, he says to them that the rulers of Judea, about whom Zechariah prophesied, but the rulers of Judea in Acts 13 say somewhere around verse 26, Those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, verse 27, because they didn't recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. But verse 30, God raised him from the dead. And many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now as witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the, in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Which is what we read in Hebrews. God appointed him. He's the shepherd. But what God promised to the fathers that they had to seal up in a jar that would last millennia or that would last centuries, he has thus fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus from the dead. 
So today, if you are not a Christian, the call is for you. Seeing the power of God in his word, the power of God through prophecy to bring all of these things together, all of these themes about betrayal and rejection, all the themes about failure of spiritual leadership, about the loss of a physical nation and the establishment of a spiritual one that serves God in the heart and in the spirit. All of these things that he said before were intended for you and me, that we might obey the gospel of Jesus, who is the one chosen by him, sent by him, but who died because we rejected him. He died for the sins of the world, you and me both, that we might have forgiveness in his blood. If today you are not a Christian, repent of sin. Confess Jesus as the Christ. Be buried in his name in baptism for forgiveness of sins. We have water here that you might be baptized. If today you are a Christian but haven't lived right, well, repent. Pray God from the heart. It's his desire to do us good in this spiritual Israel. But we're glad to pray with you and for you because we're on the journey together. If you need to obey the gospel or if you need the prayers of the saints, let your spiritual need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and we sing the song that's been selected.